come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a movie talk show podcast that comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total world domination you can help us out with that all you have to do is head over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button or write us a review all of that stuff helps us get found by other like-minded folks like you these are the internet radio superstars Ali, michaela sean and i'm colin and tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by sean Sean, what sequel did we watch tonight? <laughs> uh, we watched, uh, from the year 2000, Urban Legends Final Cut. Directed by? The Academy Award winning John Ottman. Academy Award winning, you say? For Yes, the Academy Award winning Jonathan <laughs> Ottman. Yes. <clears throat> For what? Uh, editing. Was it for Bohemian Rhapsody, right? That was the one. Yes, the the worst edited movie in the history of being nominated for Academy Awards, and it won the Oscar for it. Like there were layers to 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 me discovering that just now. At first, I was like, just the visceral reaction of Bohemian Rhapsody winning anything. But then also, yeah, my next thought was, but the editing was especially terrible in that movie. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's funny um, because Rami Malek was in that movie. Um, he's in another movie, not edited by John Ottman, but he's in a similar scene in the little things, the movie that a- apparently I turned everyone off to, you uh, mean- that, pr- that pretty much does the same editing over editing as that scene in Bohemian Rhapsody does. So maybe it's just Rami Malek. He's like, people look at his face and they're like, we need to cut around this. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Wow. Well, I used I'll to have, have to go a back lot and of, watch uh, his scenes in Gilmore Girls and cross reference and see if that lines up there mean, too. You mean Rami Malek star of Twilight Breaking Dawn Part Two? Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, well, I sponge that one off of my. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. He will forever be the star of the video game <laughs> Until Dawn. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, that's just no. Nope. Oh right. yeah, that's right. He was. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't we play that? Yeah, we did play that. Yeah. But uh, I, I think I was more like, oh, Hayden Ten of Tears in this game was right. more where my mind was. Oh, at. Was, was that the like the ski place yeah. one? Yeah. Guys, yeah. it's iced the video game. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Which is what I was thinking. That's I couldn't remember the name of it. That's what I was thinking of when we were watching Ice. Just like the video uh, game. Do you remember how sad it was me trying to play a video game? That was funny. <laughs> that was fun. Oh, that's, 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 that game was fun. Yeah. I liked seeing that like as a group. It was a slasher, yeah, when we were all together. Video game. Yeah. Um. But, um, I mean, I used to have uh, respect for uh, John Ottman because John Ottman was a composer. Uh, he yep. was Brian Singer's composer for many years. So, I mean, he did oh. great music for, like, uh, un- the usual suspects and apt pupil, everything that Brian Singer yeah. did. He did, you know, Superman yes. Returns and all that stuff. Uh, I think he then he edited those movies, too. Right? Yes. If I remember correctly, he was the editor and the uh, composer for most Brian Singer's things. And then um, this yes, was his, and he was the editor and composer of this film as well. So he's a triple threat editor, <laughs> yes. director, composer. This is his first and only directorial. Yeah, he did a short film earlier on. But other than that, this is it. OK, I mean, was it a dare? Like what happened? He it was uh, I mean, it really got down between uh, one guy who had worked on the first movie and John Ottman, who had who had come in and quote unquote, you know, auditioned for his role as director and John Ottman won out I feel by like with, hair. I feel like with sequels, they don't really care who directs it because it's an established property that has a built in audience. So they really don't give a fuck. Yeah. That's, right. Yeah. And I think um, uh, it came down to it as well, because the other guy, I think, was an associate producer on the first movie. He, he had never oh. directed before either. Um, and at least John Ottman had some work behind him. Yeah. I mean, he was, again, editor and composer, and he worked with Brian Singer, so he's done, like, big movies. So they had more confidence in him to come in and direct this movie. Yeah, so I wonder, what a, I wonder what appealed to him about this movie. Was it just the paycheck? Probably. Just the paycheck, yeah, this right? is I mean, how you get that... your foot in the door doing a, it's a director gig. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, yeah, and he wanted to direct. Like, that was his, he's like, I want to give it a shot. I've been doing this, and uh, I'd sure. like to do it. Yeah. So I went in all in on Urban Legends, Final cut. Not urban legend. Mm-hmm. 
Urban Legends. Yeah, why? Okay, so the movie is called Urban Legends, plural, the final cut or final cut. Uh, but the first movie is called Urban Legend, singular. Why? So this was like, is this a sequel to Urban Legends? No, it's a sequel to Urban Legend. Mm-hmm. Why? Uh, why S? Why plural instead of two? Because you oh, flipped think- the two, Colin. You <laughs> the two. I know I, they, the title sequence is U L two, and then it fills in and becomes Urban Legends. Isn't that like, great? Is that because we might be idiots? <laughs> yeah. It is, Colin, because instead of just going with like Urban Legend or Urban Legend two, they had to change it, add a, a subtitle, and then fuck with you in the opening title sequence to be like, yeah, it's part two, but spin it, it literally the two literally spins around yeah and, so- into an S. <laughs> it's it's the weirdest. It's janky for, for this movie, I will say. It no, it's, and it's appropriate for this movie, Sean. Yes. Colin, we've established that movie studios think we're idiots when it comes to sequels and their titles, as evidenced in our uh, frequent off-mic discussion about Now You See Me and Now You See Me Too. Right. <laughs> They clearly could, think we're idiots. <laughs> like the the biggest. The, <laughs> the, now you see me as well. <laughs> and it's not even. I wouldn't even accept P O O. Now you see me, comma two. But yeah. it's now you see me, numeral two. I mean, yeah. the biggest missed opportunity in in title history, right? Yeah. Yes. And now right. You don't. Yes. Now you don't. Come on. Come on. Yeah. No, the only way you get away with that is if it's your Dumb and Dumber two. And that's and that was the last one to get away with it. Did they flip the two? <laughs> look who's talking to. It's 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 T O. Yeah, look who's talking to. That also did it. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So, uh, the first urban legend. Uh, we want to catch you up because yes, uh, these this is a favorite franchise of Sean's. Apparently, we did watch the original on this show, so you can go back and check out that episode. <laughs> That yep. one starred a uh, perennial Hallmark Christmas movie favorite Alicia Witt as the uh, final girl. And there was a killer in a ski suit or not a ski suit. What do you call it? A winter coat <laughs> with a furry pretty <laughs> jacket from the thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I had a premonition. What do you call those? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, what, it's a winter coat. What do you call that? Yeah. You're right. Colin. It was a winter coat. You are very a correct. It's a parka. Yes, parka. Yeah. Yes, it's the McQueen it's, it's, yeah, Parka. Yeah. That movie notoriously did not take place during winter time, though. Yeah. No, Didn't we summer. watch what was the other one? Uh, Detox or ICU? The guy looked exactly I, the same. It was a, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Those coats even show up in this movie for some reason. Yeah, it's a callback because this movie yeah. does a lot of callbacks to other movies. But we'll get into that. So this is um, <laughs> okay. So the the this movie comes from a pool of 90s it's the 90s slasher film which um yes. was given birth by the success of scream in 1996 right scream revitalized the dormant or uh, slasher genre and came mm-hmm. up with a new way to do it and basically what they were going to do okay if I, correct me if i'm wrong here but the what scream set up is that we're going to introduce the concept of mystery into the slasher uh, formula, which, I mean, if you look yes. at some of the old slasher formula, you know, movies, that is there. One of these yes. people is the killer. Um, the whodunit. Yes. So that kind of gave, it wasn't just a crazy killer going and killing people. It was, you know, the, the escape from a mental institution or whatever, the Halloween clone. This was one of your friends is the killer. And by the end of the movie, you're going to have to determine who it is. Um, one of your very good looking friends is the killer. Probably. How many of these movies are um, like, uh, well, I don't know. Is that fair to say? Like, how many of these are good? That's, <laughs> Colin, that's what we're trying to find out. Right, okay. It is the mission of the freak show. That's, that's what Colin, here, yeah, that's what Sean's journey is yeah. in life. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Which one of these are good? Why? I mean, you know. Who brought Over Valentine? This one, what is the meaning of life? I did. Sean did. Who Sean brought, brought Valentine know, and the faculty? And I know what you did last summer. Sean. I okay. did. Okay. All right. All right. So, I mean, <laughs> hey, if that's your thing, right? The 90s slasher film. Well, how is the 90s slasher movie different than the uh, 80s slasher movie? What's the primary characteristics that we have going on here? Big budget. High Big profile budgets. cast. Yeah. Probably way less exploitative elements to yeah, it. Yeah, not gory. Um, they tend to be not gory. The nudity is hit or miss, but it's usually way on the left side, especially compared to 80s and 70s. And they, and they usually down. and they usually factor young people that like movies. Yeah. 
This is the, it's like, that. see, I always see that as the post Tarantino generation where like our movies are hip because they're talking about the movies, even though it's a movie, right? And mm-hmm. Scream, of course, does this because they're obsessed with horror mm-hmm. movies. So this one has, even though it's urban legend, right? <laughs> We kind of already did that in the first one, right? We we did the uh, we w- rattled off several urban legends that you've heard of. What's left over right. is the discard pile for this movie to pick up on. So it says, no, we're going to make a movie about people who make movies who are killed by a kill. This is the also isn't this like the um, uh, is the slasher on campus like is this like a subgenre or like an offshoot yeah. or like it's in there with yeah. The- yeah, I mean, so much so that it was it was mentioned in reviews for the movie um, about it being kind of the uh, the downward end of the slasher on campus genre. Yeah, I'm actually surprised. I mean, watching looking back at this movie, like how bloodless it is. At one point I was like, is this a PG-13 movie? Because in the mm. beginning, within like the first two minutes, there is like a sex scene. Uh, and but it's a. Uh, in a um, plain restroom, mile high club kind of situation, everybody's fully clothed. And it was like, I don't know. I I was just kind of like, okay, so what, even this is like, I mean, I suppose it's more than what you get away with on television and maybe it's more than a PG 13, but it was still like very chaste, you know? Mm. And then the bloodletting through the entire film, except for one kill, there was one bloody murder which I think Sean is going to tell us eventually that that was a reshoot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> to punch because up believe the movie. It or not, believe it or not, audience, we went like 25, 30 minutes into this movie, original cut, no kills. Not until we got to uh, uh, the blonde in, her, uh, in the shower. Um, yeah, that was a reshoot. They had to go back to uh, gore up and pan out the time a little bit for this movie. Okay. All right. So they didn't think it was as as exciting as it could have been. So they had to go back to reshoots. Yeah. Okay. So this movie um, stars who? Jennifer Morrison. Who we would know from? Lots of things. House. Stir of Echoes. Help me out here, guy. How I Met Your Mother. (laughs) Yeah. One of the most unbearable characters ever on How I Met Your Mother. Oh, Um, well, thank God I missed that. Oh, God. She um, started once upon a time for a long time. She did. It's true. She's like the star of that show. Yeah. She was in. Uh, uh, she was in uh, Warrior with Tom Hardy. Okay. And she's. Oh, oh yeah. She was Star Trek. Kirk she Smart. was Star Trek mom. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, she directs. To um, she does a lot of stuff. You've seen her around. Yeah, because I I knew who you know I I watched House, so I took notice of her then, and then it was like, oh, she's the ghost in in Stir of Echoes, uh, yes. criminally underrated. Spoiler. Movie. Yeah, I was like, you just spoiled. Here, here's a criminally underrated movie. By the way, this is how it ends. What? I'm not saying or how this it is, ends. This is the big. This is the big. Movie. Uh, in- uh, <laughs> ah, so, um, you son of a bitch. All right, so we have other. Are you, we at the time they were called like the CW casts because it seemed like most of the younger folks who were in these movies were actors who were in a bunch of CW shows. You got to help me out here. If any of these people were, I'm not entirely sure. Anson Mount, later of Hell on Wheels, is in this movie as a young fellow. Yes. Uh, who this else guy, is- we we were talking about this guy has had the weirdest fucking career, man. He shows up in the most random places, and he looks like a completely different person every time. Like he really does. It's insane. Like he was in Crossroads as Britney Spears' love interest. Like Colin, you said he's Bohannon in Hell on Wheels. And um, and more so recently, he's in Star Trek Discovery. Like he shows up in the weirdest places. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That means he's an yeah. actor, right? He can camouflage himself in different. Okay. Um, <laughs> we also uh, yeah. I'm looking through his list of movies. Yep, he can definitely camouflage himself. Uh, well, yeah. Anthony rec- Anderson. Yeah, you know? he's the other like recognizable person. Um, this I don't think this was that early in his career, right? No, I feel like he's always been around, you know? Yeah. I feel like he's always been like this. I mean, he plays the same role in fucking everything, you know? But yeah, I think his fir- one of his first like major roles I remember seeing him was Me, Myself, and Irene, mm. the Jim Carrey, uh, uh, what's her name movie? Jesus. Wasn't he um, on like a bunch of TV shows for a long time, too? Like, yeah. was he on? Was he on Hang Time? Like, there was a lot of like teen sitcoms and shit he was on. 
Yeah, uh, my, I will look him up. I don't know what hang. My time memory is. of him is that he's mostly a comedy guy. He would cross over into my sphere when he was in Transformers. Famously, he was in that big budget movie, but he was in Scream Four, and he was in the remake of The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Uh, oh, so he, so he does, he's two thirds of the way of the wall. Yeah, huh? he has. Well, not the not the original. He's in the remake. He plays the Texas yeah. Ranger in the remake. He does. Right, but this gives true. him two out of three now, right? So, <laughs> well, which one did we watch? We watched the Scream original. Four. Scream Four. Oh, Scream Four and this. Yeah, that's right. You're right. Okay. So someone bring Kangaroo Jack and we can put him on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. Um, I, uh, yeah. Uh, this, and, yeah. This is that's yeah. That's my nothing but trouble. Don't you dare. Oh well, now oh, oh, so you have Sean. a weakness, Sean. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well. Oh yeah. Yep. All right, so, no go ahead. Way to bring punish it. You, huh? Bring um, it. You know go ahead. You know his pick it is next week, right? No, <laughs> I no. dare you. Holly's just love crossing it if you off what that. she was going to pick next week now and writing in Kangaroo Jack instead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think she's just moving it up three spots. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. It seems to me, I thought we had talked about Hart Bachner on a recent episode, but he's also in this. He's basically he the oldest person in the cast as, uh, you know, at 35 or whatever. He's, he's obviously from Die Hard, right? Uh, he yes. was on this show before we did Batman Mask of the Phantasm. He's a voice in that um loretta divine is in this she was also in the original movie playing the same character that's the crossover uh does she yes. appear in urban legend three urban legends no. 3? what's it called urban legends bloody mary okay so they're going they with, go yes, the plurals urban legends they did okay um yeah and they went supernatural in that one too maybe that's like, at least that for. one is an urban legend yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the main guy in this, uh, the Trevor character. Oh, Matthew Davis. I didn't recognize him. What have we seen him in? He was Warner in Legally Blonde. Right. Right. A far better performance than he gave in this movie. Yeah. And and he had double the opportunity to give a good performance, and he sucked. And was it uh, Joey Lawrence also? (laughs) Yeah, it was. Yep. Hates this movie very, very much. (laughs) All right. Uh, there's other, you know, familiar faces, obviously, that you recognize. Eva Mendes. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. Like Eva Sorry, Mendes I forgot. Was in this. Yeah. <laughs> she was in this, but her character, like, didn't register to me at all. So I'm like, no, yeah. She probably has, shit. like, six she minutes of screen it. time total. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what's this movie about, Sean? What do we got going on here? Uh, so this movie is about, it's set at a film school. Um uh, a nondescript film school. This took place. They shot it in Canada, if you couldn't tell. Um, and, and it is about uh, film students who are finishing their thesis films uh, for their finals in class. And the winner of and there's a prestigious competition going on. It's called the Hitchcock. You win the Hitchcock Award for the best film. And like they say in the movie, you're pretty much guaranteed a, like a shot in Hollywood if you win this award. So there's a major competition going on. And then people start dying off. Okay. So you're saying like that sounds like okay so, that's, that sounds straightforward and legitimate, doesn't yeah. it? So where's the urban legend plan? Yeah. I saw well, I one. Mean, so I mean they explain them throughout the movie, maybe a little heavy heavy uh heavy handedly. Yeah. Um because Jennifer they, Morrison's character gets the idea from uh the survivor of the last movie, right? The uh the security guard that yes. she's gonna make Reese. her thesis film is gonna be based on a killer who kills people based on urban legends like the original movie sure <clears throat> there you go boom yeah urban legends uh, plural so then she has to work in a couple of urban legends that i have to admit i have never heard of before maybe you have out there uh the kidney one oh, no You've i've never heard, heard that, that but that was in the first one wasn't it no it, it ended the first one they were going to end the movie with the kidney heist which is what opens kind of this movie okay that was the but that's it the was never pulled off yeah, the kidney one's the only one I've heard of in this movie. Yeah. These other ones, I'm like, this is a stretch. Okay. Yeah, like, uh, you, do you remember about the college where all the kids, like, screamed at midnight and they, they couldn't hurt, hear the other kid being killed? And you're like, huh? No. no. Yeah. I, th- I think more than uh, <laughs> taking a break from finals, I think screaming for a minute and 15 seconds would uh, not release tension for me. It'd probably give me a headache. So I don't know what these kids are doing. Yeah. Uh, the movie opens with this dramatic, plain, uh, and probably expensive uh, sequence in a, well, I don't know, you have to at least get the <laughs> fuselage of a, or the interior of a plane. Um, yes, Sean? They, Sean has his they hand found the, They found the fuselage uh, from the movie Tin Cup, 
on a lot in the studio and decided to use it for that part in the movie. It was originally going to take place on a boat, but they found the plane, so they said, hey, let's just put it on this. There you It'll go. Save, saved a couple From bucks. From Tin Cup? Yeah. Well, why not? A uh, boat just... would have made a lot more sense, actually, based on how these people are behaving. Right? Yeah, like, like a party bus. luau boat or yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I was like, they're acting like it's a party a, bus, yeah, but they're on an airplane. It's called a booze cruise. Everyone knows about a booze cruise. <laughs> right. Yeah, and a killer who we see is running around stalking victim, or I don't know, he like uh, apparently kills the power and kills everyone while he the does. two <laughs> kids are in the bathroom trying to join the Mile High Club, right? He kills he everyone. Would have had to have, he would have had to have gone around and just stabbed 57 people Yeah, through up and down that plane, which to and me, if you just think about, is like hilarious. <laughs> like he gets tired halfway through. He's like, <sighs> right? So oh, and like Jesus. and no one and no one screamed. No one did anything. He just no. walked around each individually, like he's handing and, out. And the pilots are not averages. concerned at all either because the plane's still flying. So they're right. completely unaware of what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Can you not? Well, they're dead. He killed them. They're also that's, dead that's in the true. in the they he killed dead. everyone. Except for yeah, I'm then, guessing he started with them. Yeah. Right? So this plane's just autopiloting it autopiloting itself. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Plane. <laughs> Autos. All right. Yeah. So um so what I guess my issue with this opening scene and how it connects to the rest of the movie, right, is that it's making these like and then everybody's dead. And you're like, I don't believe it, you know, so I can't follow it. And then, you know, there's this girl who's being pursued by the knife wielding killer. And then all of a sudden it's revealed that this is a movie that's happening. But what it didn't do was establish like any of the characters who are going to be in the rest of the movie, really. I mean, in any kind of major role. Right? right. So you're already like five or 10 minutes or however long that fucking thing was. And you haven't really set up like what your movie's about. It's just like, there's a killer on a plane. You're like, what movie right. is this? Oh, oh that you're was not, all. <laughs> Don't worry about that. That was just a setup. And here we go. Right. They're, the they're not. It's a, uh, it's superficial. I mean, they're not doing any legwork for any of their characters, like you said. So it's really kind of a, uh, a pointless scene like it shows that they're shooting a movie and where we are but that's it it's like real well thing. it only shows you that once once it's revealed that this whole beginning sequence right. that you just went through is like that didn't matter the movie's actually starting here five minutes into the movie and now we're gonna have to set up our characters but then what it does is it has then you're five minutes in and you have to now start building the movie which is why i was looking at my fucking watch the first murder happens at 17 minutes in and Sean's saying that that actually uh, was a reshoot. <laughs> okay, so this is yes. this is the the best sequence in the movie. Am I? Yeah, yeah. Would, would you get, agree with it, this? I mean, it, de I it depends what you're going for and what you, you know, want out of this movie. This movie got off on a bad foot with me because during this whole plane scene, you know, this guy's talking to the girl about how like the the Twilight Zone story about the gremlin on the wing of the plane is based on a true story, and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So is this movie trying to follow urban legends that are from pop culture that might be from other real urban legends like that's this like snake eating its own tail at this point so i'm already like really this is where we're starting with this movie so by the time we get to this next scene colin i'm already like what is the fucking logic of this movie and where are they getting these urban legends from yeah yeah it has uh i mean because <laughs> all it does i think in the remaining 17 minutes is set up uh you know several rivalries between some of the characters um you know saying the director's an asshole and here's the you know girl who's just trying to make it in the business uh jennifer uh, morrison who's trying to you know uh, win the award here's her teacher who seems to understand you know her position and wants to help her here's you know the uh asshole dp i think the, prior to the 17 minute mark was when the or no no it was later than that when the dp like reveals this startling backstory in this scene where he comes up to her and he's like you're only here because your dad well his producer is joey lawrence <laughs> yeah yeah he, i, I think like, he's a, he's like an agent yeah the dp is the the mm like the yeah, foreign Lawrence guy yeah the anson mount was the dp right and he's like you stole my genre mm. well that's like a fucking crime against humanity right there right you right what, I, you're making a movie your thesis is in also a thriller fuck you this is this right. is one of the other elements of this movie that i find uh, hysterical because it, it 
they're really doing some like lowly film school student stuff in this <laughs> and really going Eddie after how pretentious yes how pretentious film school students can be i'm not gonna say mm-hmm. all of them but they can be and i think they're really they're like hitting it pretty good i think for but, as okay. over <laughs> overly done or just bad as it is i high. agree sean i agree but man when joey lawrence is going in on her about how like your dad's an oscar winning documentarian or whatever he says it's like yeah dude that's how hollywood works if you're this mad about this chick getting into the school because of who her dad was you're in the wrong industry you might as well get the fuck out now buddy like <laughs> yeah nepotism like, is how okay, hollywood jo- works like all right joey how are your brothers do they have careers too yeah, right. it's not like right. you're the I, Lawrence brothers or anything, right? Right. I would kill for an outtake where she'd be like, "Okay, Joey Lawrence, fine." <laughs> you. Yeah, that'd have been funny. Is this? I wonder. You know, I mean, obviously, the idea is this is supposed to be an insider look at uh, you know the, the the film school and then the film industry, but it did kind of almost feel like it's someone who like wants to go to film school and it dreams that this is what it's like, because yeah. this is a dream film school where they have giant sets with aliens on them in one place. And they have, okay. they get to use the entire, you know, interior of a, a plane and they have like a spooky carnival and there's a graveyard set. And it's all like, Ooh, you know? <laughs> yeah. This is supposed to be like USC. I was going to say, think this that's feels what they're going like for. USC to me. Okay. I was I was gonna I was gonna say you brought up a point, uh, Jennifer Lawrence or Jennifer Lawrence, Jennifer Morrison, sorry, um, when she's her movie is like a rip. She's kind of like ripping off the other dudes' movie. Okay, is there is there a theme they're supposed to be going with for their thesis? Like, are they supposed to be doing Hitchcockian movies? Is that what they're supposed to do? It would make if, sense if, if it's the Hitchcock Award, like. Well, I don't know if it's like no. if it's like that's just like the name of the award and it's for any movie or if it's supposed to be that genre. Because if it's not like, OK, she is kind of straight up like ripping off his idea. Like, I am I alone think... in that? Like, she's totally ripping him off. <laughs> yeah, because he was doing the killer on the plane. He's I guess doing, right? like, he's doing urban legends. She's literally like taking oh. his idea. Yeah, wow. Uh, like, I didn't even think of that. Am I the only yeah. one saying that he's got a point? Like, she's <laughs> totally ripping him off. All right, Anson. Yeah, Mount. this is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like what's his name? It's like what's his name from Midsummer is like. I'd also like to study this place. <laughs> like that. You're just like fuck you, dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to look at it. She also has a friend. This is going to be important. A guy named Travis. Travis, unfortunately, has gotten a C on his uh, thesis mm-hmm. film, and so we see him because he has no money. His parents don't have uh, any any cash to give him. He's got no prospects, right? And he's got a bottle of Jack Daniels and he's sitting out in front of his house. And, you know, she and her this and is, he are friendly. And um, this is my favorite. Uh, again, add it to my list of favorite things. Uh, Sean's favorite things. Another one is just the, the grabbing of the full bottle of whiskey and just sitting down and smoking and drinking to like the clear sign that you're depressed. <laughs> oh, this guy is beyond depressed. This guy is like hanging by a thread, man. A over thread. a C minus. This guy is like, and because Sean, it is like it is like early afternoon when he is doing that. Like, <laughs> yeah, this guy is, it's 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 brunch time. It might, might be. Yeah, he <laughs> might need to check in for a for an evaluation. Maybe put him on some watches just to be safe. I mean, they should have. So now I'm trying to think of the chronology of this movie before we get to what goes on with Travis, because uh, uh, prior to that is the punched up 17 minute sequence or 17 minute in sequence where a girl at a bar gets roofied. Right. I think by Anson Mount or the other guy. Right. Which was Travis. I'm not, I can't remember. By a um, by a black glove killer. There oh. you go. And um, she ends up passing out in the coat room or no, they, they try to do the black Christmas, right? Where she gets the, somebody jumps out of the coat room and wraps her head in plastic. And then we cut right. to <laughs> her in a bathtub full of ice and Oh my God, her kidney's gone and it's laying outside the tub and she gets up. No problem. And the killer, we get to see him dressed in a rain slicker, uh, out in the other room, uh, starts coming in and then there's this big fight. And then it ends up actually with a decent, uh, cause I was like, Oh, this is better than I remember. I remember these being like bloodless movies, but she tries to get out the window and he's like pulling the skin. He puts his hand in her kidney wound and like pulls it out. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then he he drags her back in the glass of the window breaks. And like, uh, it's like a scene from, uh, Dario Argento's Inferno, right? He grabs the 
the window pane and brings it down. Only this time, just fucking chops her goddamn head right yeah. off and it falls in <laughs> the snow. Straight outside. up guillotine. <laughs> yeah. Straight up guillotine. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, this is probably the best sequence. Yeah, then, that's that scene was surprising. I saw that. I was like, oh, this isn't the movie I thought it was right. going to be. And then, of course, it was. <laughs> right. But that fooled me for a minute. But well, for a brief moment, you thought yeah. you, there was there was, was a chance, a, you know? There was a glimmer of hope in there, man. <laughs> yeah. Because, I, like I said, I saw it in the theater was the last time when it was new, you know, so uh, many years ago. And uh, and I was like, oh, I don't remember this. I remember being kind of weak. This is like a pretty strong moment. Because then the dog's out there, right? And then he throws the kidney out, and the dog right. eats the evidence. This is, this is the part that kills it for me, though. This doesn't make any fucking sense. Why is he taking her kidney out just to toss it to his dog? Like, my understanding of the urban legend is that your organs get stolen to be sold on the black market. Yeah. If he's not doing that, why the fuck is he even doing this? Well, because I, I think... think he, well, well, I was going to say, I think he... Uh, I, I think whatever happens after the uh, extraction of the kidney doesn't matter. Like it could just go, he could throw it in the garbage. As long as nobody finds it, like the legend still exists. Like she got, in a, uh, woke up in a tub of ice, kidney's gone and that's it. Whether it gets sold in the black market, the We're urban gonna, legend. We might not be able to explore this right now. We might have to do it later, but given what we know the motive is, why is he doing the urban legend thing? Yeah, right. exactly. It doesn't what, make what any the sense. What's happening? Why isn't he just killing people? Right, because like, that was the guillotine the... part is not part of it either. Yeah, but the guillotine part, I get it. It's like she's trying to get away. That's and just That was yeah. yeah, circumstantial murder weapon. Yeah, that, but that, why did he take one. her kidney out? It's like that is yeah. a scene that exists just for the audience to go like, I've heard of that yeah. urban legend. Because when you think about it, why didn't he just kill her? He, he got her yeah, in exactly. the uh, the exactly. coat closet. Boom. And I imagine that's probably where the original scene ended was he killed her with, by putting the bag over her head in the coat closet, the end. Right. And then they reshot this extra thing just to give like, well, we need something. Well, no, the whole thing. Uh, I don't think she was, if you watch us the movie, I don't think she's uh, mentioned at all. This whole scene, like bar and everything was reshot, reshoots. Really? Okay. All right. Yeah. Whole thing. Okay, so the other thing that we have to do is obviously we have to establish our red herrings then because we have to figure out who among the cast is the killer. Um, so one of the red herrings, obviously, this thing with Travis kind of well, there, okay, but before this, because this is why it was it was jarring as fuck to me because uh, you know, we we met Travis, he's sullen and sulking on his porch, and then I think the next scene, this is about 30 minutes into the movie, right? Because I was like, oh, it's been 13 minutes since our last murder. Uh, one of the actresses, the bad uh, bubble-headed blonde actress, who's a terrible you know, actress in, in their movie, uh, she ends up alone in the set after hours, and she is stalked by a killer in, who wears a fencing mask. Because as a slasher movie, you have to have some kind of identifiable mask on your, but, your kill. But he has like a yes. shiny jumpsuit on, too, that yeah. it's like tucked into. It's like a full body, like condom outfit. It is fucking <laughs> terrible. Yeah. It, it really is. It, it's and it looks so terrible. heavy. It looks yeah, leather a, and heavy. A, as a slasher 20? movie, you need, you need a mask. But as a murderer, a fencing mask seems very impractical. Yep. Right? Yeah. I can't imagine you can see very well through that. Right. I'm yeah. never putting on, but shouldn't you be able to, like, what's the point is to not get hit, but to be able to still see when you're fencing, right? Yeah, I, am, I have no yeah. idea. I have never fenced. Yeah. I've never put one on, but I imagine it's not the best. I don't know. Colin, are we adding this to your bowling and dummy practices? Are you a secret fencer? That's something no, else none of us are rich about? enough to be fencers. That's a rich people sport. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, haven't, I have not uh, ever worn a fencing mask. You know, that was actually a thing I thought. Uh, I think at the time when this movie came out, I'm like, wow, we're at fencing masks, right? Like, have we exhausted all the sporting masks and all we've the done masks. all the clown masks all the bandage masks <laughs> yeah and i, I actually we did, we did paper mache i thought we were done but i mean my hope was brought back uh when they did uh, like happy death day and the scream queens tv show you know i actually had uh you know like oh okay you, there's still you can still find masks out there <laughs> right, you, can still, you can still do it <laughs> it is nice to know isn't it yeah um there are lots of masks in this movie, though. Random masks. Very true. Yeah. When we when we do see the the coats from the first 
um, urban legend. It is, I think, at about this time in the movie where Anthony Anderson and his friend show up in ghoul mask to yeah, scare Jennifer they're the Morrison. Nerds, right? They're the pair of nerds that you have to have in your slasher movies. Right. Um, they're the nerds. They're the effects nerds. Yeah. Um, so there's this murder scene that happens and this is where you're like, Oh, this is not the same as the first murder scene because I didn't see anything happen. Just a lot of the camera was moving around and like, I was like, what? And there's a nod to peeping Tom, which I think was also done in Halloween, the resurrection. If I remember Sean, when we talked about on that show where you have uh, some kind of recording device, you know, or a murder weapon attached to the camera right right yeah so he's going to film the moment of her death like okay and he records it for them and then he plays that reel back during the daily session and it's like ooh, oh who's real is this and oh we have to watch her get a kill is it real is it not real i don't know and like immediately wow that looked that, real i think that's when we learned that like did you hear that travis killed himself last night and we're like oh, what what did we see that <laughs> right and the most sensitive way you want to break the news of one of your fellow classmates and probably friends dying just like hey did you hear he died which is basically anson mounts uh will have telling him that he, he uh killed himself yeah. yeah yeah it was uh abrupt and you're like what yes and then there's a funeral and then <laughs> there's a there's a get together <laughs> uh, a, a oh, gathering sorry, at the near, memorial right yeah yeah the, yeah at the film reel memorial there's a gathering where Hart Bachner uh, talks and quotes Truffaut, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in, in the most pretentious fucking film school bullshit I've ever seen. He's like, I, you know, I think Truffaut once said, and then he's crying at this point. It's, uh, it's really something else. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Um, but then sh in short order after this, Travis reappears. And we're like, what? And the guy's like, you know, because he appears to Jennifer Morrison. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm not Travis. I'm his brother, Trevor. And we're like, <laughs> okay, you look exactly like the other. I mean, like hairstyle, like down to a T, you got a scar in the yeah. same place. So I, I was like a nice little scar on the face, coincidentally. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay, is this actually Travis pretending to be Trevor? You know, I'm, I'm my own twin brother. Is that what we're supposed to get out of this? Is it a red herring? <laughs> right. The, he's the killer, obviously. Right. Like, He's the most obvious suspect because he's like one right. of the only people that we get to know in the course of the movie. Right. Mm. And he obviously, he sometimes shows up at, uh, at places right after the killer has been there. How did you find out about this? And like, what were you doing in the area? And that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He never gives a good answer. He's just like, ah, life sucks, doesn't it? And then he just walks away. So <laughs> it's just like, give me a fucking answer, dude. Yeah. Um, he's not forthcoming. Well, there's several moments uh, like the, in the rest of this running time, because it takes forever. It felt to me for uh, Amy. That's the main character to figure out that there was a killer. Number one, right? we were like 40 minutes in before she even realized, like, I think so-and-so was murdered. And you think yeah. Travis was murdered. And I think there's a murderer on campus. Should we call the police? No. Okay, but why, why would not? you do that? Because there's no movie if you call the police, Colin. <laughs> you well, have is... you go to you go to police junior. I mean, to be fair, I feel like we hear about a lot in this country, like fraternities killing someone and not calling the police and just kind of like letting a body be found. So I guess like in a college setting, I find it more believable <laughs> than other places. But like, I'm still making a lot of allowances for this, you know, <laughs> I'm like, as someone that works at a college, that is really fucking disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And think about it. Anytime you see like fraternity or sorority mentioned in a headline, it's because someone died. Yeah. Yeah. yeah body. Like, yeah. Body found in a wall. After yep. Two weeks or some shit like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a scene and see, this is the other thing too. Like, uh, uh, Trevor and Amy have this like immediate connection that I'm, it's the way that the movie is shot more than what's actually going on. They just whisper. Yes, I was going to they... say it's not them. Yeah, it's definitely not. It's definitely not the actors. In it's this that movie. unspoken thing. Yeah, there's unless a lot you're of just rubbing two pieces and... of cardboard together. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but he says he would prefer that she doesn't call the police because he has had he was creative. 
like Trav- Travis was creative in film, but I was creative <laughs> in like crime or something. And, you know, I don't like the law. And I'm like, okay, wish- <laughs> okay. What we're doing here is we're establishing because he's telling her not to go to the cops because he's the killer. Right. Right. He doesn't obviously. I, I, want to, yeah. Right. I really wish he was like, he was the brother, but with the brother with an eye patch or he was like <laughs> prison Mike where he wore a bandana or something. I wish he had like something to be like, Oh, okay. That's the brother, you know, because like think, and again, like I told listeners last week, like thinking back to like some seventies Italian giallo, like, There'd be a little more something fucked up about him. Like he's missing like the ears. Like Terry and Todd and Blood Rage, how they have like striped shirts, but they're different striped shirts. And one has the hair back and one or has the hair forward. Someone's more sweaty or something. Like it's something to differentiate. Yeah. yeah. Parts his hair you know, you know, yeah. you know, you're in a bad spot when Blood Rage did something better than you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is basic. We learned this in Rugrats with the bow with Phil and Lil. Yeah. You know? Yes, exactly. It's yes. literally the only difference between them is the bow. Yeah. Well, what, I like when uh, they would Phil, switch Phil it. has pants, Lil has a dress. Yeah, yeah, but you don't really notice. I know, it's true. Do you um, remember the episodes yeah. where he would just like take her bow and put it on and his and <laughs> yes. mom would mistake them? Like, come on. Very true. Rugrats is um, genius, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Travis, they do have one difference. Um, Travis wears his hair down and no gel. Trevor puts it up in the front. I swear to God, that's no, that's true. He barely that's has true. any that's hair true. to begin with. You can't that's, tell. That's, that's why I, I missed it. Um, no, it, it is true. I noticed that. I was like, his hair is a little spikier. At least they give him that. Yeah. Yeah. If nothing else. Yeah. Yeah, Sean went on the record at the end of last week's episode saying, like, you got to look at this movie like it's an Italian giallo. So I was all all ready to, like, reappraise this film <laughs> through that lens. And uh, so how did you come to this, Sean? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I need gloves. to hear this. Besides I need to hear this defense. <laughs> now, come on. Now, it, it just. <laughs> that, was it. that was your only one, wasn't it? No. Come on, we want <laughs> you to make the case here. If you look, and I was thinking about, I think I was thinking about, um, what do we watch? Uh, the most Profundo Rosso or? Yeah, Dario Argento, Deep Red. That was the most it, recent deep, one, probably. Yeah, I think Deep, it reminds me of Deep Red the most. I think just because I think the location on the college and kind of it's very, um, oh, I don't know what to call it. It's just kind of cement blocks and all that shit. I think the setting looks like a place where, you know, uh, nondescript Italy could be done um i think the weirdness of the entire story lends itself to that genre and uh, again the killer being with black gloves obviously that that does it for me um because but, every- know, the introduction of the twin brother the the weird um if you, i swear to god if you put a a filter over this and makes it look like the 70s you dub everyone's voices Put a little more Italian music on, in there. I swear to God, you look at yeah, me. Like, lot of work. This is, I'm a not saying lot. it's brilliant, but I'm saying it is it. You are I'm editing saying it's still got that <laughs> same <laughs> thing. You're basically saying, well, if I just like completely make it into a different movie, it's a show. <laughs> no, right, what, what, I'm t- what I'm saying is that I, I, can, uh, I have uh, I, I've chosen to see it that way. Like it doesn't have those elements in it, but I can. Like I can work with the movie and imagine what they're giving me and be like, it feels like an Italian gel to me. Hmm. Colin's going like, to be like, nah. I feel like I know who killed me. Is That's like yeah. the example of like an American yeah. attempt at a giallo movie. Yeah, yes. the, uh, that we've watched on this show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, American, like, was, you know, you look at like Brian De Palma movies, I think like they have a lot of influence of those, you know, it, it all goes back to Hitchcock, but I'm like, I'm missing the Hitchcock Literally. influence in this too, even though it's like, you know, the, well, you're going to use Hitchcock's themes in your movie, your thriller yeah. movie and all. But I mean, you're missing a lot of the elements of giallo, <laughs> the, you- the, the the unique weaponry, the uh, psychosexual True, we do need motivation. You know, generally that's uh, you know. I know who killed me. Even had you know. There's always something, and the the amateur sleuth because I was like, is Amy gonna like try and figure out who the killer is? But there was like no sleuthing. There was no detective work. There was like. You know, she just kind of runs from one scene into another where the killer comes after. Her. There's two scenes where she's stalked alone uh, by the killer. And I was actually sitting there going like, okay, these scenes have no tension to them. And I'm like, is this the director? I think he does telescope or telegraph his uh, scares uh, sometimes just by the way he frames his shot. You're like, well, that's the one where the dog comes through the window. This is the one where the guy comes in through the door. Um, Yes. This is the one where he flipped the light on and then somebody's in the other side of the thing. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, so you and know they, that that's going to happen. But the other thing right. that it did was, um, <clears throat> did I lose my train of thought? I might have. I'll come back I mean, to it. Probably, Sean, what are you going to say? <laughs> well, I was going to say that um, it feels like he, it feels like he elongates these scenes for, but you can really feel it in the moment. Like you feel the character would automatically like flip that light on to see what's in there, but it takes her like two minutes to get to that point. Instead, it's her staring into a window, like being scared of what's going on around her. That's basically her motivation is like be scared and hug this guy for the whole movie. But I feel like he's not like getting to the point. Like he's, he's gotta be a terrible editor. Like if this is, like it doesn't feel like he knows pacing. Yeah. Well, which is weird from a guy who clearly understands it when he's working on yeah. other people's movies. I mean, that's why it's right. kind of like what is happening, but I guess what I was going for was, um, and I'm trying to think of the analog in the scream films, uh, you know, but you have your girl, your, your female hero who, you know, is going to be final girl, right? Uh, because what is it? Girls, somethings and chainsaws. There's a book written where this author figured out that the, you know, analyzed the slasher movie and figured that you end up with a final girl. Um, men, women and chainsaws, men, women and chainsaws. Thank you very much. And so it's like, we know there's nothing going to happen to her because mm -hmm. she's going to make it to the end of the movie. So it's her right. trying to survive the guy, but it's like, I know that nothing's going to happen to her. That happened twice. There were two scenes where she was being chased and it was like, well, I know nothing's going to happen. I think in scream, if I'm incorrect, there's like maybe one scene where Sydney's by herself. And then the next one, she's with a friend and the friend is like, well, the friend could die in this scene. You know what I mean? So there is like a stakes to it, but not if you just have the character, like your hero, like, okay, she has to get away at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be in the next scene of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. Um, so there are some more deaths. Uh, other people get killed. Um, one guy, the uh, like, I don't know, he's a German camera guy is killed during the aforementioned midnight scream of everybody on, and on campus. And he's clubbed to death with a, uh, a camera lens, <laughs> I guess, because we don't see this, it happen. This <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, this I, even if they weren't all screaming, there this campus is fucking empty. Like no one would hear them anyways because there's right. no and one I, around. So they had to like do the cheat of like, oh no, she can hear him through her boom mic, even though he's probably half a mile away on campus. Right. Those like are very what? Sure, through brick walls and all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah, that's why you have to say quiet on set. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, because you'll pick up all the sound in a half mile radius if you don't. Right, all the murders <laughs> happening in Chicago, they can never film around there because they're just hearing <laughs> murders all the time. <laughs> well, she ends up with a security tape that basically proves that there's a killer because that's the thing, like officialdom, right? The woman who is a security guard who went through this before does not believe her <laughs> that this is happening again. <laughs> like, okay. Um, so, you know, so she takes the security tape and then she's chased by the killer and there's this, you know, like a chase scene. And then she ends up uh, the best chase scene ever. Like it almost felt like a, a, a like a, a naked gun gag or something. Like they're just throwing <laughs> shit in her way for her to trip over while trying to get away from this killer. Like yeah, weird I, thing. She's on a dock. So she hits like, it's like fishing poles and then swimming stuff. And then there's like a goat or something like it gets weird. Yeah, it feels like something like Tucker and Dale versus evil probably did. Right. Like, yeah. You know, it feels like if they would have put, right. Where did all the shit keep longer, coming from? Yeah. Yeah. It would have been a parody scene. Had it gone on like 10 seconds longer. Right? It was a parody like, scene it, it, as it did. Cause she ends up like in the storm drain. Right. And then she run, flees as the killer sees her through the grate. So she runs into a fallout shelter, some kind of fucking underground, you know, like the, the, the yellow flashing lights are going off and we're like, is it the apocalypse? What's just happened? Where the fuck are we? <laughs> um, Why are we underground now? Uh, John Ottman's a big fan of, uh, uh, alien and aliens. Oh, uh, he, uh, those were his, his, those were his nods to Cameron and, um, uh, <laughs> Scott, uh fantastic yeah uh, eventually amy seeks solace with uh trevor who's like i'll protect you even though i wasn't there when you needed me but uh, i'm totally here now and so this leads to the most bizarre that's exactly sequence. how we delivered it colin that was great yeah because i think <laughs> she's job. like help me there's people who are dead you know uh, right uh, oh that's great we shouldn't go to the police okay, yeah good 
Um, so, uh, we get our movies like a second sex scene, which is also in the opening thing for this movie on prime. It said like, there's nudity in it. So I'm like, at some point, and this was a uh, bare backs and all that Sorry, stuff. Colin. Yeah, I know. I was like, uh, it's PG 13. And anyway, okay. So this is what, this is, this was the sequence that I did not fucking understand the goddamn logic of. Right. Okay. So she lies down with him. Then there's the sex scene that isn't a sex scene. It's actually a dream where she imagines that he's the killer. She wakes up. He's not there. She looks out the window and the lights are on in the tower of the building across the street. She's like, oh, shit, I got to pull all my shit on and run over there. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> why you go over there? She goes over there. Eva Mendez is there in this like lair, right? Where she's like waiting for it. She's like, I knew you sent me this note. And Amy's like, I didn't send you a note. And then there's like, oh, God, the killer's probably here. And I'm like, wait, wait, <laughs> are you telling me that the killer sent Eva Mendez the note to get her there and her turning the light on would lure Amy there so the killer would get them both in the same place at the same time? Holly understands my pain. I can see her yeah. <laughs> like what was happening? What I, the fuck? Yeah. No logic. None. Yeah. The no only explanation, thing. Nothing. The only thing is, while watching this movie again, uh, this movie really wants to be Scream 2. And like I said in the group chat, this movie really wants to be a movie. (laughs) It's trying real hard, but it's it's almost ripping off scenes like verbatim. The sound booth scene from Scream 2 is again repeated in this movie to uh, a far lesser degree. I mean... Um, we, we should expect it, though, right? Because that's the story. She ripped off the other dude's movie. He's ripping off Scream 2. He, he literally says in the movie that that's what he's doing. So we should Basically. expect it. But there's, like, there's like, there's like specific, like, mirrors of this. Because this is like the, the scene. Like the sound studio. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is, and this is the scene where Courtney Cox comes out of the door and Nev Campbell thinks Courtney Cox is the killer. So yeah. this is that scene in this movie. Yeah. And there's a bunch more, too. Uh, once we get to the ending, it's basically the, the same standoff thing. standoff at the end? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's exactly the same. Yeah. It's exact. Like, it really wants to be screen <laughs> yeah. two. It's really going for it. Okay, so this standoff, we get the killer's motivation. We are introduced to the killer. There's a big wait, scene. Oh, and are I, we, Wait, are we are we there yet? Like, have we gotten to the point? Where are we at? We, we're right. in the tower. Well, we, Colin, it's it's not done yet. It gets longer, um, which <laughs> I know you're 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 glad. Because oh yeah, they they, have the t- they, there's the realization of how they're all connected, right? Oh my, well, oh a, my god! This a, well, hold on, there's a there's a whole bunch because we still we still got the the tunnel of terror, which we didn't go through. Uh, well, we we're ta- talking about the Eva Mendes part, which is at the end of the tunnel of terror, isn't that? When Eva Mendes well, no, is like in the room and she's like, the "Killer no, told me you'd is, be here." There's a whole nother. Th- Where are they at when that happens? Then <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I thought know. that was the tunnel of terror. No, that was no. that was prior to see the, that was prior to the, the dream sex scene. All right, because uh, was it? Yeah, because Trevor Ooh, was going to guard her, her and they were going to lure the killer instead of going to the cops. They're going to lure the killer to the next shooting location, which was the yeah. Tunnel of Terror. Yes, where Anthony uh, Anderson and his buddy were like rigging the right. place up with bodies, and then they end up bodies in the place, and the killer's right. there. Okay, but where the are Eva Mendez and her meeting then? Where is this scene taking so, place? Yeah, so after. So, uh, tra- uh, Travis, Trevor, 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 Travis, whatever. He <laughs> takes Trevor. her back to her room and then he's like, you need to go to sleep. You're really tired because you've been, you'd witnessed murders and you've been interrogated by the cops. So you need a nap. So they go to sleep. And then when she wakes up, that's when she looks in the tower and sees the light. And that's when she goes to Eva Mendez. And, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. But, <laughs> um, right. But the tunnel scene is before that right yeah. right that's what i'm saying that yeah. this is that's post the tunnel scene is him being like oh take a nap you'll be fine yeah but the, yes. that's what i'm saying yeah. there's nothing but we added the tunnel but there's nothing really added to the plot with it you know what i mean it's like that's i guess why I, it's like yeah, this the next is not an urban legend i've heard of either yeah the next major plot revelation oh, you've never, have you well, it's not a urban legend per se but haven't you heard about uh have you ever heard the story about the um the gangster's dead body that hung in uh one of those little um like the fun house amusement things uh <laughs> hung in the hung in there for like 15 years before yeah, they figured the, out it was dead body yeah, no, yeah. i have heard that it's it's 
uh, this dude's body was literally like preserved in wax and it was like traded through museums over the course of like 50 years. Yeah, I, I do know this one. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. A, a big exaggeration so, on that. <laughs> well, yeah, I yeah. mean, nothing's like I don't think any of the ones in here or except for the one, the kidney heist are like exact verbatim urban. They're really skating on that title. Uh, with this movie yeah. yeah i'm i'm convinced and this might be a, a wrap-up thing i don't know but i'm convinced that they literally just threw all of the urban legend shit out the window and they were just like we're making a movie about people that are making urban legend movies and that's all we need yeah because they say that this urban legend is like all the kids in the town get murdered and used as the, as the decorations for the tunnel up there. Like, I'm sorry, you're telling me a whole town's worth of children are going missing and getting murdered and this keeps happening from town to town mm-hmm. that this one carnival keeps going to? What the fuck is this? Yeah, the traveling yep. carnival of death. All right. Yep. But it's pretty obvious if they're leaving that much of a fucking paper trail. Yeah, I know. Man. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say it's like Funhouse, but then we get Larry Block in my ass and I don't want yeah, that. Don't fuck want you, that. Larry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Sean, tell us who is the killer and why ah. is he killing these people? So, big reveal. Um, after uh, Ava Mendez, and I mean, I even think it's like after that, after Ava Mendez uh, dies, it's because they get stalked by the killer. Ava Mendez gets pulled out of their hiding spot and she gets hung from the up in the bell tower. So she's gone. Now we've got to. Oh, does she go back to the school stage area well, at this Trevor, point? Trevor, I think she figures goes to bed. out how they're all connected. Is yeah, the next right. like, well, you were doing that. In, like this, right. is yeah. why we still have the police. Yeah, this is one of those fake outs where she comes. She comes running outside, and he's there. Just happenstance. He's Was there. He right. The this this happens she's a lot. Like, yeah, and she's like, "Why are you here?" And he's like, "I figured something out. Come with me." And I was like. Okay. <laughs> now he's like, I you, I figured something out. You gotta believe me. Yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's yeah. the most well, amazing sure. delivery. Because I've known you for so long. <laughs> right. It's another one of these circumstances where nobody's asking any fucking questions that are like pertinent to what's going on. Your friends are getting murdered. You've seen it, and you're just with this guy. Who's just like, I know I was gone for an hour while these people were being killed, but come here. Yeah. And. Yeah, he figured out that they're all uh, all of them were crew members on his brother Travis's film. And when they watch yes. Travis's film, they come to the shocking realization that the entire film has been removed and only the end credits have been spliced onto a shittier movie, meaning someone has stolen Travis's film. And then we're like, OK, here we go. The killer is motivated by your movie was better than mine. And so I'm stealing your movie and I'm killing everybody who is associated with it in order to cover up my crime. Who can it be? Right. Who's left? We have Who's too left? many we, people we... left where there's like four guys <laughs> and they Quite all are in the climax with the final girl. Right? Yeah, yeah. too many white guys what? at the end of this. We get white to guys point. in turtlenecks and leather trench coats. There I mean it's the it's it is. It's and it's the film school look. Uh, yeah. cause you're cool. You gotta be wearing black leather coats and turtlenecks. Yeah, Anson um, Mount is still alive. Uh, Joey is, Lawrence is re- still alive. Uh, Trevor is still alive. Hart Bachner is still alive and her. So there's four dudes and her and it's revealed with, I mean, like there's no real suspense to it. Hart Bachner's basically like, okay, you got me. I did it. I mean, kind of the, well, they have to first, they try and hunt down, uh, Anson Mount which I wanted to throw this into the uh, logistics territory for Holly and Michaela to figure this one out, that they stop him at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was good. <laughs> well, see, this is, yeah. The, 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 yeah. Again, the logistics department is like, first of all, that happens. Second of all, there's a reveal that in the middle of this part that it's her, like <laughs> because she's kidnapping him at this point by, yeah. by gunpoint. Because they think he's the killer because he's, quote unquote, the only one left, even though Joey Lawrence and all them are still around. And so they kidnap him and bring him back to the set. And this is where everyone starts monologuing. Now, this is where Jennifer Morrison has called Hart Bachner to not the police. Yeah, her trusted the, the confidant, right? Yeah, the professor. A teacher, Yep. they call to bring in, to be like, look, this is what he's been doing. Do something because you're the teacher. <laughs> you call the police. 
teacher, teacher, yeah. we're having a problem. This felt back like here. a Can fucking Scooby Doo ending, or like you know, yeah. this is like this is kid mentality, but, uh, right? But like the adults will take care of it, and the kids are all like, you know, they're like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. People are he dying. might as well just pull the off. fucking rubber mask off his face. You know, that's how stupid it was. I'm the killer. <laughs> it it, it kind of is. Adult. Like that's what she does. She but instead, we get out. What, DJ? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, well, he re- he reveals himself as the killer, also by shooting a dude through a wall. Yeah. Now, one of the best like gunshot things like ever. Oh. Like he gets sh- oh. dude. Anson now gets shot on the shoulder, and he is plowed through a stage wall. I like to comical loved, effect. I loved everything about this scene. And w- where does he end up? Everything Holly? about this scene. So not only does he get shot, and he doesn't just like fall backwards. He gets blown back through the wall, like he said, bust through the wall. The wall he busts through opens to a full on, <laughs> a full on cross legged alien overlord sitting in like the cockpit of a mothership. Yeah, and it's spectacular. But it's like a haunted house you would build in your backyard quality. Like it is. It's- yeah, because no, they're like, well, it's a movie set. Magnificent. Yeah. It's right next it door is. to the graveyard with the foggy, you know, the fog in the graveyard, yeah. which is where the climax <laughs> takes place, where all of them come together. And there's just yes. the logistics Joey Lawrence of that. also happens to be here as well, because he's no, the biggest set. shocking reveal of this movie was busting through the wall. <laughs> it was one of the best moments. That like, if you're going to break, break a character through a wall, that's the thing to find. I loved it. Yeah. That, it, that goofiness I like. Actually, the end also brings in L- Loretta Devine. So you've got six people now all in this place, uh, you know, but like you're pointing the gun at him. So there's a case of mistaken yeah, identity. Standoff. Yeah, everybody has Small guns backwards. eventually. Big because a little China episode when we talked about Mexican standoffs. Yeah. 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 Yes. But and, here we go with the Scream 2 ending again, where everybody's yeah. got a gun on someone else. Yeah. The killer, everyone's circling each other. Nobody everyone, knows whose side Everyone's on. explaining their Joey motives. Joey Lawrence is in the background, just like in Scream 2. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone's explaining uh, yeah, their motives, motives one by one. Right, yeah. mon- monologuing is happening. Fuck teaching, mm-hmm. that's also happening. He's not happy. Yeah, that's it his is motive. Revealed yeah. That heart, yes, that Hart Lochner was, and, this, and if the movie wasn't weird and complicated enough, now we get into them just telling us shit motivations from decades earlier uh, like he's been playing the like it is it's exhausting because Hart Bachner apparently lost the Hitchcock award when he was in that school because Jennifer Morrison's father cast the deciding vote against him and so he's wanted revenge before she was born slash right, an adult right. I don't know so, yeah no so that, just- that poses a question so has he spent his entire life chasing the offspring of his nemesis or no. does he just, he just got a job there and he realized who she was and like, Oh, now's my shot. I yeah. can finally yes. get revenge. So that's it. Yeah. See, I like if to I can I work like you into movie. this because he wants to frame her. That's how he's going to get revenge. She's yeah, going to go I, down I, for the crime. I like the other movie. I want the stalking her entire life before yeah. she's even born. See, movie. Holly, I like this to is... think he, I like to think he overheard Joey Lawrence bitching about her nepotism admission into college and then put two and two together and was like, wait a second. So he was like, now, now that would have been good. He's just like, Whoa! right. That would have been good for the flashback where it shows him listening <laughs> in to, on to everything. <laughs> like, want, like, like a little girl. On, oh! I want full on animated. <gasps> like right? the whole shebang. Yep, and then him trying out a costume for the first time and everything. (laughs) But I was going to say, this gives a little bit more to the uh, murder scene uh, where she gets her kidney taken out and her head chopped off. He's doing it to frame her. This is why it doesn't matter what happens to the kidney. I I, 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 I believe so. I don't know how he's going to connect it to her and everything. Because she wanted to make a a movie about urban legends. If it's just a murder about urban legends, he does that and then blames it on her. This is pretty thin. (laughs) <laughs> i got it <laughs> i mean i i understand that that is probably the stupid logic behind it <laughs> it's it's dumb like oh. this this is oh. a dumb movie yeah mm. well mm. it's it's not it's not scoring any points in the smarts department but so we get a full <laughs> on like it is the ending of this is an event to me. like it is a, it is a whole thing like i i laughed at the absurdity of this whole thing because there's uh, shovel fights around a, uh, there's a casket there's a hole in the ground joey lawrence is doing something 
<laughs> when he's like he's running around and getting shot and diving into graves. Anson Mount is getting back up and dragging his chair with him. There's fights for guns, like there's prop guns that get spilled onto the floor. And thank God, Chekhov's gold-trimmed gun was introduced earlier on. Thank goodness. So that it could come back here because mm -hmm. Jennifer, once all the guns get spilled, Jennifer Morrison knows which gun is Reese's. And she uses it to kind of shoot Hart Bachner in well, the stomach. Yeah, he when doesn't give her a kind of attacks her. He attacks her <laughs> and she shoots. There's, yeah. There is. There is there's one, there's one shot, and it happens for like five seconds in this movie. After they all pick up the guns and point them at each other, they don't linger on it long, but it's a group shot, and it shows them they're literally within a foot of each other, pointing yeah, guns at each other. Yeah. And it's the funniest thing that you get to see for like three seconds. You're like, why are they that close to each other? It it's like seriously, when they that shot literally looked exactly like the shot from the office. When <laughs> remember after they do the the murder game? Yeah. It's yeah, exactly. The exact same thing. They're all seriously it, like inches apart. It really does. It's uh it's it's humorous in the how much they don't pull it off. Yeah. yeah. I well, think. Then the movie gives us another fake out. Like after our bad guys taken care of, then we're, we see like them, uh, another scene where like, it just it, keeps going. Trevor's Colin. accepting his award. Going. And then the, what, the other guy, the, the PA like opens fire with a fucking machine gun. Then we find out that's actually a film that Amy has now graduated to actual Hollywood production. She is a real life director and all the other people from her class have, you know, forgotten all of their conflicts with her and are now working with her and everything is happy. And yeah, nobody's blissful. an asshole anymore. Everyone's nice and working together. Yeah. Near death experiences will do that to you, I guess. But then it keeps going. And then we cut to an insane <laughs> asylum where Hart Bachner is watching this movie that she's made on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and he's all doped up and in his chair. And then the big shock of this movie is I that know. Rebecca Gayhart, who was the killer in the first movie, sorry, spoiler, is in this movie as the nurse and like actually looks and winks at the camera. Looks directly into the camera. Yeah. Oh my God. See, I brought this movie tonight because I wanted to bring five movies tonight, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. And, and then I the, think I pulled it off. And the movie plays the Alfred Hitchcock presents theme, which I was offended by. Right. <laughs> offended by that right, it would just because you can do it. <laughs> Sorry, Sean, remind me, how did, like, I thought she died at the end of Urban Legend. They never she found got the shot body. She a river, and then they did a... a uh, oh, she's button. at school. Yep. Flash forward. This is how okay. it really let, went. Let yeah. me tell you how it really went. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so she somehow went this. to med med school and became a nurse during this time. I guess this was and also what I was wondering station. about. Hart Bachner doing surgery on the girl to take her kidney. I'm like, what does he know? Although yeah. that stitch job looked like shit. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. he didn't know anything. Yeah. But man, the way she looked directly into the camera and said, "You and I have a lot in common." I. I was so irrationally mad at that. I could not believe that they had the gall to do that. Oh, uh, well. Um, okay, well, I mean, we've, we've pretty much hidden it from you, listener, what we actually think of this movie. Um, this is the <laughs> In Defense of Urban Legend 2 wrap-up. Uh, but first of all, we're going to take a moment to read some of your mail. And to do that, we're going to need our mailman. His name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Thank you, Igor. Thanks, Igor. He's oh, why is he wearing? He's got the fencing mask on. He's actually fencing. <laughs> he's. You guys didn't know this. He's a world class fencer. Hey, no, he just wants you, you to think this? that that's his muzzle. It's different. Everybody has <laughs> hobbies, right? Well, that's very true. Yeah. Um, okay, so we want to let you know how you can interact in this interactive portion of the show. All you got to do is head on over to our social media. That would be Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And you can follow along on Instagram. Um, also, also, today I was looking at a t-shirt on Tee Public, and I remembered, oh, we have t-shirts. Oh, yeah, how can you get one of our t-shirts? As a matter of fact, I just ordered two. Nice. Did you? Sean, I, I was wondering who ordered those because I get like a notification when you order. <laughs> I was like, I wonder who ordered these shirts. 
That's yeah. me. Not only I t-shirts. Finally, we've I got mugs. Them after six months. We've got blankets. We've got hoodies. Where, where can they find them, Michaela? Baby onesies. Um, you can go to tpublic.com slash user slash Saturday Freak Show. You can see all of our designs available there. If you have an idea for a design, let us know. We'll see if we can make it happen. Maybe. Because, I don't know, there's a couple nobody's bought, so maybe we'll do it. Maybe we won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make it worth our time. If you have anything that says fuck on it, I want that on a baby onesie. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right, well, uh, MF Mad is the keeper of the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. MF Mad's gone above and beyond because he found two people in this movie that we have apparently put on the Freak Show. Well, this is the hallway. Okay. The hallway of fame. I want, now what I want is I want MF Mad, if he would be so kind, as to go back and to see individually how many people we've all put on the wall. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Sean. I'd like to, I'd like oh, to know so only, because, only because I think I'm winning. That's all. Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, <laughs> Derek Asland, right? He was in this movie as P.A. Kevin. Remember from the end of this movie, P.A. Kevin. He was also in Kids in the Hall Brain Candy, which we did on this show, and Resident Evil Apocalypse, which I brought Kids in the Hall. Both <laughs> absurd. Both absurd to be on this show. I'll and uh, Kevin Hare, who was a police officer in Urban Legend Final Cut, was also boy in Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. And he was in Resident Evil Apocalypse as homeowner. Oh. There you wow. go. Okay. Real wow, okay. No credits here. <laughs> congrats to them. Okay. Hallway. Uh, congratulations, sirs. Your you, uh, certificates you. are in the mail. Um, about tonight's movie. Urban Legends Final Cut, Matthew Ola writes writes in and says, uh, I think I'm going to go with the Tom quote on this one. I could be coloring. Mm. You could be. Tom said that? Yeah, there was some movie we that's, were that's watching. A, it was that's hilarious. A joke. Yeah, that's an old, that's an oldie. But he's Monster like, in the closet. You could watch this movie, or you could be coloring. He's like, I could have been taking a <laughs> shit. I could have been coloring. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, I was stuck with us. Uh, well, Tom... Oh, Tom. Todd writes in and he says, uh, you could do a movie that doesn't suck. I still love the podcast. I, I'm here for this taking shots at Sean's pick. Damn. Uh, Michael Whitaker wrote in and said, in the world of horror movie slashers, this is definitely one of them. This whole franchise. <laughs> that, that one I liked. <laughs> he says, this whole franchise passed me by. It felt like one of the million scream clones. <laughs> Uh, about last week's movie slugs, Brett Williams wrote in and said, uh, this was a common feature on the USA up all night rotation to flip yeah. on after getting back from the bars in college. Um, the previous week we watched a movie called iced, uh, both karate warrior two and Peter Gatt thought that the Australian VHS release cover that we posted on our social media was better than the domestic version, which we also posted on our social media, been karate warrior two thought that it was an indicator of how cheaply the movie was made the art on the domestic box cover i mean For you're sure. correct you're not wrong so yeah <laughs> there's nothing expensive about that movie no well, uh novato judoka says i bet none of the fools in this movie could even ski the key the the k-12 yeah that's, that's a better off dead joke yeah uh <laughs> leamy <Thanks>, 70 <laughs> leamy 72 said the first kill in that movie was like austin powers steamroller scene I think we brought that yeah, up on that episode. Yeah. Uh, Grant Parrish, we posted some photos from the 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 movie, which were very hard to do because it's a movie that has like no one has seen it. So finding like it doesn't exist on the internet. Yeah. yeah. So finding <laughs> pictures from it were all from all grainy VHS copies. And Grant Parrish said it looks like a commercial in WandaVision. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pat Hatfield wrote in and said, I didn't expect to enjoy the podcast as iced as a movie. I've never even been remotely interested in seeing, but you made it very interesting and entertaining as you do. And I'm glad I listened. I tried to think of another ski resort slasher, and I've got one that doesn't take place at a ski resort. And there's no actual skiing in it called the devil's <laughs> times five. Uh, he also mm. says you, you may or may not be interested in knowing that Lisa Loring, remember she was in it. She was Wednesday Adams in the old, yeah. uh, Adams yeah. family is in another slasher movie called blood frenzy directed by a man who directed hardcore porn, whose name I don't remember. This is relevant because she married a guy who, who was an actor or director in hardcore right. porn. Well, Pat. I did the heavy lifting here and I looked him up and his name is Hal Freeman. And he is of course famous for making the caught in behind series 
of porno films, uh, episodes one through twenty-four. That's right. Caught in behind. And caught how in the much behind, homework did you behind. do, Colin? I looked on IMDb. All right. Uh-huh. Uh, so Brett Williams also and then wrote. He in. casually came across this by chance earlier this week. We uh, know Colin's Colin. dedication yeah. when That's he right. gets. Oh yeah, I rented stuck them on a all. subject. I'm still. Colin, I'm only... were you uh, were you behind the beaded curtain at Family Video? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, did you go through the saloon doors? Yeah, yeah. You remember the good old days of the forbidden <laughs> of saloon porn. door? Yeah. We remember. Yeah. <laughs> I love it's, that still, they, it's still the good ideas. I love that they always had to put a door that would give a sound away you were going back mm-hmm. there. They oh, couldn't yeah. let you do it in, in quite right? a shame. They okay, had to mom. broadcast it. Mom, I'm just going to go to the bathroom. Eat, eat. Sean? <laughs> or the beaded <laughs> plaque from the beaded curtain, too. Right. Both of yeah. them will get you. And God forbid one of those breaks and all the beads fall onto the floor. <laughs> oh, how embarrassing for you. <laughs> <laughs> The video store porn check in the back. That's of the- a cringe humor scene I would love in a movie, Sean. I would. That would be my favorite scene in a movie if I ever saw it. <laughs> they just all fall. All right, uh, copyright twenty twenty one. We're we're copywriting scenes now. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, well- <laughs> well, that Brett, sounds like a Curb Your Enthusiasm thing. I would love that. Yeah, oh my god, I could totally yeah, see that yeah. happening to Larry David. <laughs> I love it. Well, Brett Williams also wrote in about this movie, uh, Iced. He said, uh, damn, I went to just watch for this one since it's one I've never heard of, let alone seen. And of course, no digital streaming anywhere. I guess it's nope. another lost VHS movie. <laughs> I'm looking at the Google images. I recognize the VHS cover as a fixture in most rental stores back in the day. I just never rented it. I found it on YouTube. So at least I can watch it before the podcast. Well, Brent, we should send you a medal of some kind for actually following along and finding that movie because we also watched it on YouTube. Yeah, we all probably watched the same copy. Uh, Okay, so I know we're running long, but now we're going to tell you uh, what we individually thought of tonight's movie, Urban Legends. Uh, Final cut, starting with... Holly. Holly, let's go first. Holly, what did you think (laughs) about the sequel from Oscar-winning John (laughs) Oppen? Um, so clearly I had a love for the alien scene. We're not going to dispute that genius, marvelous, one of the greatest scenes seen in a while. Um, the grabbing of the kidney wound, very impressive. Definitely did not feel like it belonged with the rest of this movie. However, at the end, I was literally, I was literally sitting in my living room, holding my face, laughing at how much I hated everything else about this movie. And then when Rebecca Gayhart looked at the camera, I said out loud by myself in my living room, "This movie can go fuck itself." And I got up and walked out to, <laughs> and went to the kitchen. Whoa! Walked out of your own room. Yeah. Walked out of her own house. Out. I was like, yeah. I gotta, I just gotta stand up for a minute and just walked out. I couldn't handle it. So that pretty much sums up my my opinions about this movie. I think it's goes without saying it's a it's a hard hard pass from me. Michaela, what did you think? You know, when it comes to these '90s like theme kind of slashers, I make a lot of allowances because I feel like even if they're bad, they're usually a good time capsule. Uh, and I like time capsule movies. Uh, and you know what? This movie shockingly did not feel like a, much of a 2000 time capsule. And that, shame on them for that. You know what? <laughs> you know, like Joey Lawrence is not enough to put in a time capsule. I'm sorry. He's not like you need more. Um, and, you know, like Valentine's not good, but there's things I enjoy about it. You know, th- that is for an example. But this one, man, like it doesn't make any sense. It is just sloppy. It has like, even the cast isn't people that would draw you to see it at all. So that doesn't even have that going for it. And, you know, there's there's really not any urban legends in this, except for the kidney thing and the stuff they try to make up for this, which if they really wanted to go that route, why not do like, I don't know, like movie making superstitions, you know, like on set superstitions, since you want to make this about making a movie, you know, bring the whole like you can't say Macbeth in the theater thing into it or, you know, things like that. Um, There's stuff to do. They just chose not to do it. It's and then the ending was really just like the icing on this fucking shit cake, man. Like it, it, I didn't know how it was going to end because it was taking forever to get there. But I did not expect that. And that was not a good way to end it. And it 
it's it, it's not funny it's not cute the wink and the nod is just infuriating and so it's it's i'm gonna have to pass on this movie it's not worth watching try spend time with any of the other 90s teen slashers and you'll have a better time than this it, this is just maddening in every way <laughs> so, colin what did you think I don't have any, I mean, I've said this on the other episodes that we do, whenever we do fucking 90s movies, I keep looking for the one that's going to change my mind, but I don't have a nostalgic attachment to this era because like I came from the 80s era and then it was like, what happened in the 90s? We neutered all of our fucking horror movies and they're all like vanilla horror movies aimed at like teenage girls or something. I don't know. It's just like... I there's there's i th- think this was uh colin's was this your drug time colin i think because everything got so dull and boring like this is when it like we gotta make these movies better i'm yeah, dropping well, ass I don't, like, I think even, your time. but this was also <laughs> in the 90s sucked because the big budget movies when they, they would did, do those yeah. were like the worst cgi right when cg was coming around you had movies like deep rising and event horizon i know some people like that movie but you know where they, it was just like a relic it's like fuck I mean, aside, if you're not Candyman, right, or The Sixth Sense or The Blair Witch Project, right, those are good 90s movies. Uh, and if you're not Scream or I Know What You Did Last Summer, you suck. You just, they all suck. <laughs> it just, they all suck. This one sucks more than most of them do. This was one of the worst of these type of movies. It was like, yeah, I mean, I swear to God, I was like I was sitting there 17 minutes into the movie going like, Oh, is something fucking going to happen? Do I care about what's happening? I couldn't pay attention to who the people were or what they were, you know, what what even the mechanics of the plot was because it was logically light and just there's no compelling uh, narrative drive to the movie. It never like installs the dramatic engine. There's just a bunch of like, I wouldn't even say they're well choreographed scenes. It has some nice production design. Oh, we got this big room that has a bunch of hanging plastic in it. Or, you know, we have the graveyard scene or the alien, uh, you know, set. So it's like, okay, you got sets and you got lighting, but they don't do anything creative with the camera. He doesn't know how to shoot a fucking, which is just shocking. And I'm disappointed because, like I said, I mean, Ottman has some horror cred. He did scores for uh, like Orphan and uh, House of Wax. And uh, didn't he work on something else? I thought I wrote it. Yeah, he did uh, H two O. H two O. Yeah, H two O. Right. Before he did it got taken that. away from him. Yeah. So yeah, and that's right. They had to give it to Mar- Marco Beltrami, I guess, to finish it off. So, um, yeah, just I was disappointed by this movie through and through. And watching it again was like, oh god, I just fucking hate these nineties. And I'm I can't even call them slashers. You got to put them in quotes. They're quote slashers. At least in the two thousands, horror got balls again, right? With you know, torture porny kind of stuff. But you know, at least the Texas Chainsaw and My Bloody Valentine, you know, the remakes came around and eventually like the Evil Dead remakes and stuff like that. And uh, you know, cause they said, like, well, it's a new era for the MPAA. We're just gonna go fucking bloody as shit <laughs> in our movies. Um, so these nineties ones are like a blip, you know, it's like, let's just skip over that decade. <laughs> we'll go back to, to horror uh so yeah hard hard pass like uh like uh, holly and michaela said uh don't go fuck fuck urban legends final cut fuck it sean what do you think um when i brought this movie tonight i didn't uh i didn't expect it to go over great um i knew i wasn't bringing high art to the freak show um but i do legitimately believe that in 20 years, this movie will, like some movies that we look back on from back then, I believe this will be looked at in a, maybe not a celebratory way, but probably a mocking way. This movie sucks, but I love the suck of this movie. And I don't, can I explain (laughs) why? I don't know. It's, it's a lot of things. It is, it's very nostalgic for me. Um, but it also rem- it, it just reminds me of certain things that what we're not getting in gore or sex or suspense or good writing. What, what we're not getting in those things, we're getting in pure wild badness. Um, this movie is one I like the badness of. Um, this is definitely for like, I couldn't... Um, I made you guys watch it, but I don't know. It'd, it'd be a really weird person I would recommend this to. Just because I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting lost in this. Um, I, I love the <laughs> badness of this movie. I, I, just like the movie itself, I got lost along the way. 
Um, but it is a bad movie, and I would never argue it otherwise. But to me, um, I, I like the badness of this movie. It's it's so like I'm I'm, I'm transfixed on the choices that are made, uh, both for directing and score and acting. Um, it's weird across the board. It's bad across the board, uh, but it's bad that I like, and um, I understand why nobody else here would like this movie. But I like this movie. Um, it's not going to be one I watch all the time, but I'll revisit this one again. Um, it, it does something for me. Um, whether that's healthy or not, I don't know. But I'm going to say give it a watch. Why not? <sighs> I'm going to pray for you, Sean. I'm going to pray for you. You pray, you pray for me, man. Yeah. You do it. <sighs> and you go back well, and watch really the and shoot off of the SS. <laughs> like, this, I'm telling you guys, this is still the demon that is embedded in his back talking. It might That's be. happening right now. It, it, it might be. I have been talking uh, out of my ass for most of this episode. Um, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> there it is. Um, that's Urban Legends Final Cut. Um, the budget on this, because uh, we were talking about way earlier, just as a side, was $14 million, Same as the first one. Also $14 million. Can you Can you see it? Like, do you notice a difference between the two? Like, was it just me? You guys know some dummy heads and everything? I did. I thought this that's one the other I like looked her. like a bigger movie than the first one. Really? Yeah, okay. but um, that's I don't rem- recall the first. They're, they're forgettable. They do like go right, you know, after you see <laughs> Yeah, them. I really 90s. don't remember the first one. Yeah. We watched it not that long ago. <laughs> yeah. Damn. All right. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a man on his own island. You don't remember Joshua D- Jackson doing that horrible Austin Myers or uh, Austin Powers impression when, With his uh, blonde when hair. she goes up yeah, and Jared Leto was in it, and a Brad Dourif was in the cold open. Yeah, I, remember I that. really don't remember. And I remember right. it was really hot in a swimming pool, like yep. And the and guy wearing was the wearing coat. a coat, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So these movies it. are uh, these movies are just for me. Uh, so we'll end on that <laughs> note, I guess. So, right. so is the first so one. So Sean, Sean, are you saying that's the final cut? No, because I'll bring three just because you made that comment. Just because you, you tried to go out God on the zinger, I'm bringing there three now. It'll be a couple years, but I'll bring three. All right. Well, now that we're run as long as the movie itself, maybe you can run this as a commentary track while you're watching. You the probably movie. could. You know, we should put this on the re-release of the. Mo- okay. Anyway, next week we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by Holly. Holly, what are we going to watch next week? Well, um, Night I- Turds or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. That would you'd bring it, and it would probably be great. Right? Yeah. Uh, no um i feel a little bad now that colin's gone on his rant of how much 90s movies suck ah. you're gonna bring you're gonna prove me wrong and bring a good one here it comes well, I, I'm, I'm i'm going a, a slightly different okay so we've talked about this movie off mic and i promised i would bring it so i'm bringing it we're gonna watch serial mom john waters comes to the freak show huh yeah. All right. Yeah. So this this is the first time John Waters has been on the show. Yep. Yeah. I think so. All right. Cool. <laughs> All right. I'm looking forward to it. Serial Mom with Kathleen Turner will be next week's movie on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you'll join us. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.